So hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out on this fine day. This is Commonweal's new school. And so just one question. Is anybody who's never been out here before to Commonweal? Somehow I thought so. OK, so you, <laughs> so you know who we are, in a sense, been around for over 40 years, uh, health and environmental institute with a broad range of programs and efforts. And one of them for the last almost dozen years has been the New School, which hosts all kinds of talks on all kinds of topics. And uh, today we're talking basically about books. I thought maybe I should have just titled it Bookworm or something like that. But um, before we get started, um, I just want to point out that there is a companion website for the New School that has podcasts and recordings of many, most of our previous ones. There's now, what, a couple hundred on there. Amazing variety that you can read, I mean, listen to. And the ones over the last couple of years at least have been videoed as well. Um, so after today, the next one set is January 12th. It's Beatrice Chestnut about the Enneagram panels, something that our founder, Michael Lerner, is very into. And me being a trained skeptic, about this kind of thing. I wasn't into it, but I did come to one of the seminars about it a couple years ago, and I was really kind of amazed about it. So that is on uh, going for four different times, January 12th, February 9th, February 24th. You can find out about that on the site. And January 25th, Sunya Schwag, MD, a functional medicine approach to chronic illness and Lyme disease. We have a long tradition in these talks of doing uh, talks about medicine and healthcare and end of life issues as well. So today, books. Um, our guests today, Steve and Molly, are the owners of Point Reyes Books and Point Reyes Station for now almost just under two years. And the bookstore was around a long time before that. In my ancient memory, it was called the Brown bookstore Brown Brown study. Study. Yeah. and it was kind of dark and scary in there and then it smelled like my <laughs> attic and um, it was fine but then it was taken over by another couple named Steve and Kate who ran it for quite a few years and did a great job here today and then decided to move on and now uh, the new owners are here so um, I think as a lifelong bookworm that it's brave to take on a bookstore in this day and age, judging from everything you hear and read about the future of reading and books. Um, but they have done it, and they have done it so far with uh, a really great response and success. So much so that, is there any Truth to the rumor that it's going to turn into an all kids bookstore in January. <laughs> no, I think we will particularly need, you know, our uh, grown up books around right. us, you know, <laughs> as, our, as going, our home becomes more of a, a kid's home. <laughs> yeah, they're going to become but, yeah. parents just next month. So, congratulations <laughs> on that. Um, so, tell me, let's, let's talk about you guys first because we'll, we'll get into a lot about the bookstore, but um, you're both veterans of the book world and reading and, and working in various aspects of that. What was your, you can both take it in any order, what was your first experience of getting excited, getting turned on to reading? What were you reading then as a, as a youngster? First, first favorite book, first love, basically. Well, it's, uh, reading has been a part of my life for the, a part of all of my memories, so it's it is actually really hard for me to pinpoint that moment. Um, I do know that the first chapter book that I read by myself, which was something I took great pride in at the time, was Charlotte's Web, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and that was something I was I was really determined because I had seen I grew up in a house with a lot of books, and and my parents read a lot, and I really wanted that experience of kind of curling up with a good long book and reading it by myself. And that one meant a lot to me. Um, and it's an incredible story that stuck with me. So um, I don't know if that's, I, I think I was already hooked by then and kind of um, it fixated on making reading part of my life. At like what age? It's an early that? memory. Yeah. Uh, hmm, I think I was six when I read that right. book. Yeah. yeah. Six or seven. He's going to say Dostoevsky or something. Yeah. <laughs> I think when I was in kindergarten, 
we had there was like a contest to read the most you know dr seuss and those kind of pd eastman books and i really liked the competition aspect of it so i read <laughs> all of those books i read all, <laughs> and i think that's what did it like oh you can get candy for this and so <laughs> yeah here we are <laughs> So when you went on into more school, did you, did you guys yeah. study major in literature or books, English, that kind of stuff? I did, definitely. Um, it, I think reading and writing remained kind of passions throughout all of my education. Um, I didn't go into college actually thinking necessarily that I would study writing and literature, but as I started signing up for courses, it was what I was most drawn to. And I went to UC San Diego, um, which is mostly a pretty engineering and sciences focused institution, um, but actually had this incredible literature and writing department um, that was run in a pretty experimental and, um, and unique way. And because it was such a science heavy school, it was actually a really unique tight-knit community, too. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of got this incredible education and experience through through that um, that opened me up to a lot of works by that were published by small presses, even though that wasn't something I was really following at the time, or um, by, by sort of lesser-known writers, and that was really exciting for me. Yeah. Same for me when I went into college. I thought <clears throat> I was going to be a biology major, and then I thought anthropology and then when I was a junior I realized the most classes I'd taken were in English literature and philosophy and so I just kind of focused on a degree that I thought could be applied in any in any situation and then I ended up working in a bookstore mm -hmm. in college and here I am now. <laughs> started yeah. there and never started stopped. there and yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. And where was that? In, in New Jersey. I grew up in South yeah, Jersey yeah. so yeah and I went and to a, a state school in, um, outside of Atlantic City. Um, so you came to San Francisco was your, and you worked at Green Hat? About 10 years, yeah. I moved to San Francisco in 2007, kind of sight unseen, just like did it, didn't even think about. And I got a job at Green Apple my first day in the city, mm -hmm. um, was there for almost 10 years, um, left in the middle to work for a small publisher in Illinois, realized I didn't want to be in Illinois because mm -hmm. who would want to be in Southern Illinois, and then <laughs> came back out here and... Yeah. Um, that's when I met Molly at Green Apple, actually. Right. I was taking her job. She had quit. That's true. Yeah, Molly had quit and gave, or given her <laughs> notice, and then um, kind of like a job fell through. And Pete, one of the owners there, realized that he shouldn't get rid of Molly and he should keep her around. So I was coming back to take, assume my old position, which Molly had had. It worked out well for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for me, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So you started there in the room. Did you come out of right out of school too and work in bookstores? And um, it was uh, yeah, I was a, a few years out of school at that point, and I kind of working in a bookstore um, definitely had been some version of a dream I'd had, but it wasn't really. I don't think I knew until I really had been working at Green Apple for a little while um, what a world of possibility book selling actually opens up. Um, I had been, you know, I was looking for a job and if I was going to sell anything, selling books made the most sense. Um, but the idea of the whole, the connection to the publishing industry and the community that booksellers have amongst each other, um, and just all of the sort of possibilities that being in a bookstore opens up were not really on my radar when I dropped off my resume at Green Apple, um, I thought I'd get to spend a lot of time around books and move on to the next thing when it came mm -hmm. along. So, yeah, um, astrophysics or changed something like that. my life in a much bigger way. <laughs> yeah. And then I would launch my career as an <laughs> astrophysicist. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't see it as a a launch pad for kind of the rest of my life the way right. it has been. For those who don't know, Green Apple is a famous bookstore in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. It's very large established and does both new and used and has basically all kinds plus music. So mm -hmm. uh, it is quite a community and, and a, a busy place, a great a great store. Mm -hmm. So you're both there for some times now. You, when you left Green Apple, you stayed in the publishing and, and book world in, yeah. in a way. So can you say a little bit about what you've been doing since then? Yeah. You and still so do. I, right. I, I left Green Apple to work at 826 Valencia, which was uh, is an organization that I'd previously been a volunteer 
um, at in San Francisco. It's a nonprofit writing and tutoring organization. We have, um, at the time, it was just one center on Valencia Street. Um, our name is our street address. And now we've opened a second writing and tutoring center in the Tenderloin neighborhood. And there's a third coming to the Mission Bay neighborhood in San Francisco early next year. And we also do work in local schools. So um, the mission of the organization is to support under-resourced students with their writing skills and help teachers inspire their students to write. Um, so we do a lot of different kinds of writing support from creative writing to uh, helping with college applications to um, tutoring on any number of big publishing projects. We also publish our students' work. And um, we served over 8,000 students last year in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a really special place. It's a really creative approach to what is also really, um, really valuable and needed academic support and um, a space for kind of a third place for some of our students to come that's not school and not home and where they can get the one-on-one -on -one support of a volunteer um, with what is often the very scary task of writing and editing. Mm -hmm. So you've been doing that and you were working still at the bookstores. And so where did this, how, how do you remember this German of an idea that you wanted to own your own store? How did that come up? I was just thinking, you know, I know people, many people worked in bookstores, including myself. I'm going, People go either way. They learn to hate it and don't want to even read anything anymore, and they never <laughs> go away. <laughs> or they really stay in it in some ways, and you guys have ramped it up. How did you decide you wanted to own your own? Well, well, deciding that we wanted to own our own. We we often daydreamed, and I joke with Steve about this. We daydreamed about Point Reyes books as sort of a far off thing, you know, like. I, I joke, I don't know how much of a joke it is, but Molly works at a nonprofit and I was working at a no profit, a bookstore. <laughs> so we had no no way to actually like own a bookstore. Um, and then we can talk about how we did that. Um, but I think like Molly, I was very invested in Green Apple. I love the community, both the community there and the larger publishing community and bookselling community at large. Um, I got very involved in other various things and um, I feel like we kind of, we just like, we dug in, you know, we were, this is something that we really love. And I think we talked about it a lot. And, and like, we both of us care a lot about space, like physical space and how it kind of manifests and what can happen in those spaces. Um, and for me, like outside of the home, that space, the, the one I find the most engaging to be in, not even just a bookstore that we own, but any bookstore that you go into it because it's this this kind of infinite realm of, of ideas and um, imagination. And and so, you know, of course, we visit every bookstore that we come across. And But, but I think maybe as a kid, we didn't have a bookstore in my town in, like, the area in southern New Jersey that I grew up. There was no bookstore for three counties. So I remember the first time when I, you know, there are these book deserts throughout the country. And so the first time I went into a real bookstore as a kid, I was I just couldn't believe that mm -hmm. I was a reader. And we would use the library a lot. Um, but I couldn't believe this range of, and I think that's just stuck with me in some ways. Um, yeah. And Stephen, um, well, I, I was working at 826, but then Stephen had the opportunity to open and run Green Apple's second store, Green Apple Books on the Park, um, which was right down the street from our apartment at the time. And um, mm -hmm. th through that experience, we were there. It was a a bookstore coming into a new space and so it was like the smell of raw wood in the bookshelves and filling all the shelves um, for the first time, you know, starting with A. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I got to hang around for a lot of that and I think that experience was really special in kind of seeing what, um, what creating something new could feel like. And we met, I mean, through that store and the events um, that happened there and the people who came by and the time we were spending in that neighborhood, we met people who are lifelong friends now and formed um, community that, com there are people who someone will ask, oh, how do you, how do you know so-and-so? And the answer is, we met in the bookstore. I don't remember how it happened. It was an event. It was a reading. We, you know, everyone went around the corner for a drink afterwards and here we are. They're you know, some of the closest people to us in the world. So yeah. Yeah. Um, there's something really special there that I think also gave us that sense of, like, what if 
what if we had a space like this that was our own? Yeah. yeah. It's also great validation. It's not every retail business that people come in every day and say, like, my God, a bookstore, what a place. You, know, you get this constant validation, which is great. <laughs> you know? um, but just knowing that that and seeing that space beyond ourselves it matters to people, I think, is another, another thing. that You don't get that at the Gap, you know, or, or where, you know. I mean, maybe someone comes and says, this is my favorite Gap, but I feel like with a bookstore, <laughs> like, you know. Um, well, when I so, first came to San Francisco, I was told Green Apple was a great pickup joint. You could go in there. And <laughs> people who actually read stuff instead yeah. of just drunk, yeah. you know. So, yeah. so I right. mean, there was plenty of drunk too. Don't worry. <laughs> and look what happens. Yeah. Here. Yes. <laughs> Truth. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> so, when did you learn that Point Reyes books might be available? We yeah. learned. I think we actually learned a little earlier than some people, but um, through sales reps. You know, we have. That's the other side of the, in the business that um, my job at Green Apple, among other jobs, was I was one of the new book buyers. So I would meet with sales reps and decide which new books were going to stock in the store, which is fun um, to kind of shape an inventory that way um, and to think like, I know, it keeps you very curious, I think. Um, but we found out because a, a sales rep had visited Point Reyes and was, in, was taking a, a friend of ours who works for a publisher in Minneapolis around and we had dinner with him that night and she just happened to say like, Oh, it seemed, I think Kate and Steve are going to decide to sell the store. And I kind of had this moment of like, you know, I was like, oh, well, what if, that was <laughs> yeah. a daydream that we had. That was, you know, um, but. Right. We kind of thought that meant like there goes our chance yeah, at yeah. ever um, um, sort of sneaking our way into Point Reyes. Yeah. So there was no plan. <laughs> there was no plan about how we would do that. Yeah. But then, uh, and so we got in touch and, you know. Um, well, then we learned yeah. about the and, incredibly thoughtful way that Kate yeah, and Steve yeah, were doing um, this process that they were they were actually seeking letters of interest yeah. um, and why people were interested in taking over the store. Yeah. And we thought, well, we can write a letter. <laughs> That's something yeah. we can do. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, when we, we sent them our proposal and they, you know, read that along with, I don't know, close to 30 others maybe. Um, and so we got to know Kate and Steve, who we had met before just through the, you know, the book world in the Bay Area is a very strong kind of tightly knit community. Um, and you know, kind of made it through progressive, successive meetings and um, got to the point where they said, you yeah, know, we'd love to sell it to you. And we were like, great. You know, we don't have money. Um, <laughs> so, like... Because um, we've been working in bookstores yeah. for our whole <laughs> yeah. careers. But, um, yeah. Um, but it became clear you were the right people. So, you know, that, it, yep. and it happened. Yeah, um, through an incredible network of yeah. support. Yeah. So... They ran it all those years and turned it into what I was always calling the Paris of Point Reyes Station. It was, it's this community center, this kind of cultural center with events and all this great stuff. And it, clearly you guys have tried to keep that going. You know, so beyond just selling physical books, it's, it's another broader kind of mission that you do. Do you want to say something about that in terms of the programming and such that you do? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, I would say the, ni the, the nicest thing, maybe not the nicest thing, but one of the great things is that beyond like us coming to the bookstore, we didn't, we didn't feel, I mean, we want to do right by the store, of course, and do right by the town and all of and these things, but we felt, we didn't feel like that Steve and Kate were kind of breathing down our necks and like, you need to do what we did and follow our lead, you know. Um, we have like total independence to kind of see things through the way that we think they should go and... Um, that's been very gratifying, and that you know, Black Mountain Circle being what Steve is doing now um, fills this other role, and we kind of think like, okay, like where is there an opening? What are things that we would like to do that we think will resonate? Um, and of course, we hope that they have. Um, but yeah, events and oh, so were you gonna? Um, oh no. no, I was. Yeah, well, I think one thing that um, we sort of brought to our experience with and kind of philosophy of what bookstores are and can be is, um, you know, there's this kind of stereotype that is a stereotype for a reason. Um, you describe the, the previous versions of the store as being kind of maybe dusty and unwelcoming um, when it was the, the brown study or Long that ago. kind of, yeah, that um, like a bookstore where doesn't really feel like people are 
are welcome and the owner just wants to sit and read. Um, <laughs> and, and that's a real thing, but also, you know, people will kind of ask, oh, do you get a lot of reading done? And um, the answer is no, first of all, because we're running a business. And then it's also because we, the reason we love being in bookstores is because of the community spaces they are and the conversations that happen there. Um, you know, we do a lot of reading on our own and that's the alone private part of it, but the time in the bookstore is a time for interaction and conversation and um, making the world bigger, not shrinking it down to one person with a book. Um, mm -hmm. So that was something that I think we, yeah. and that I know we shared with Steve and Kate, I think the first time we had that conversation, there was such a, um, a deep resonance in kind of our philosophies of what the space could and should be. Mm -hmm. And are you happy so far with how it's going? You're doing well, right? I mean, it's for a bookstore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the right. qualifier is important. Yeah. No, we've, yeah, the last couple of, it's hard to believe it's coming up on two years, and January 1st yeah. will be the, our second anniversary at the store. And, yeah, I mean, you know, we poured, we were not like numbers people, so we poured over all the numbers and we were like dreaming, you know, kind of plotting out our business plan and what we thought we could do in the store. and. You know, it's a profitable bookstore. You know, the average mm -hmm. in the American Booksellers Association has a, a, a thing called Abacus, which many independent bookstores, members of the ABA, submit their numbers each year. And on average, an average bookstore's profit is is, is like two percent profit. You know, and that's you know our discounts aren't great. All these various things, but when we looked at the numbers here, like overhead's pretty low. It's a uh, you know the being open um, 10 to 6 is great, you know. Um, there are a variety of factors went into that, and you look and, you know, it's a profitable store, and, you know, we're not, we never dreamed of, of making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, because we do it for other reasons, I think, which are the, are the true reasons for, for staying in books mm -hmm. you know, for that community. and. Because we're suckers and we like books, you know, yeah. like free books, of course, you know. Like, who needs money? <laughs> the new candy, right? It's the new candy, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was you, why I was a book critic for yeah. all those years. Yeah. Right, that's another way to get free books. Stuff. Yeah, yeah um, you mentioned it being brave, and I think we went into it, it, it definitely felt like a brave leap for us in our lives for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually felt very, we're able to feel very confident in kind of the viability of the bookstore, mm -hmm. um, both because it was such a beloved and cherished and well-run bookstore um, to begin with. And so we just felt incredibly lucky to be stepping into that. Um, and because I think we already didn't really buy into the kind of doom and gloom about bookstores. We'd already kind of seen that bookstores are dead and trans... <laughs> you know, long live bookstores. <laughs> well, that was, um, that was my next question. Yeah. That. So, I mean, that, that's what I meant by brave is that, you know, the, the countervailing winds basically are, the, I mean, at least two things. One is that people don't read anymore, particularly young people. And the second is that bookstores have been declining, independent bookstores in particular, but even the big chains are going down, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think you have counter factual information to that now, but I, I mean, that was what you were stepping into. And I was impressed in meeting with you about it that, you did seem confident in that way. Mm -hmm. So you knew something that, that I didn't at that point. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, this is so, so, I mean, here's Harper's from last month, the, the printed word in peril, you know? I mean, so there's endless media and press about this is that, that you know, people aren't buying books and reading them and that bookstores are dying out, you know? Mm -hmm. So. I will say that that was written by a novelist who does, whose books don't sell very well. So ah. maybe that's. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, well, this is being recorded. Oh I know. That's all right. Um, there we'll goes that we'll event event We're never going <laughs> to. If you watch this, we you know. um, Yeah, actually, independent, the number of independent bookstores over the last five to ten years has increased 40% or something. I think yeah, as the bigger right. chains have problems, you know, Barnes & Noble is continually having problems and may not be around, you know, in the next five years. Um, borders going under. My first bookstore job was at a Borders and while I was in college. Um, I, think, I think those large chains, like their overhead is, there's just, you, don't, you can't make that kind of money. But I think small, well-run 
businesses that keep an eye on the bottom line and kind of are nimble and, and are in touch with their community and the people who are in the community. Whereas a store like Barnes & Noble is so centralized, like all the buying happens in one place in a corporate headquarters and then gets disseminated. But that might not answer to what your community is. And I think that's, that's really hard in any business, let alone books. Um, I think a braver thing to do, we have plenty of friends um, who have opened a bookstore in a place that didn't have a bookstore. To me, that is a brave thing to do. You have no sense of what your foot traffic will be, you know, mm -hmm. quite who your audience is. Um, and I think some of those stores will have a harder time going. But the fact that we came into an established bookstore that was very beloved, that people all over the world know, um, felt like, like, wow, could it really be this easy to just come into this place of all places? Um, uh, we have friends in, in Providence, Rhode Island, who opened a bookstore, and they're going through their kind of, I guess they're a year in now, but they're kind of trying to find their footing. You know, they're trying to figure out what their kind of niche is in, the, in town and where they are. Um, but, I mean, I think they're, they're going, it's doing well. Um, but I think they're, they're, they're the kind of problems that we didn't have um, mm -hmm. because we, we know how many people in a day will come into that store. You can look at the numbers, you know, the great thing about buying a bookstore that's been around for that long is you can look back at 15 years of reports mm -hmm. and see how many transactions happened on a Wednesday in November in 2002, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of historically, like having all that at our disposal was really helpful. Mm -hmm. And we're in such a special place um, that, you know, all of us, all of us feel it right now, right? <laughs> that like this is an amazing little corner of the world um, that we know that we really benefit, not just geographically from being a beautiful place people want to come to, but um, I think when people step into the bookstore, they feel, they have a feeling like, I want to bring some part of this home with me. I want to remember my time. Um, in Point Reyes, and that's the people who are visiting for the commu local community. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of great readers um, yeah, and writers, that we're, just, yeah. and writers <laughs> that we're just fortunate to be among. So mm -hmm. um, there's some special ingredients converging at this uh, mm -hmm. western edge, to borrow the phrase from the name <laughs> of the talk. <laughs> so what's your thoughts on the the online issue? I mean, is Amazon the bogeyman here? I mean, this has been what many people have blamed the threat to, to bookstores. Yeah, so. I think we're actually reaching a point. There's kind of, I think we were hitting a tipping point where people, more and more people, there, there was kind of pushback this year that I noticed online, a few pieces that I read about, people deleting their Prime accounts and things. And it makes sense in various parts of the country um, where you don't have access to, I mean, just to use books as the example, since mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about. But if you don't have access to a bookstore, then where else would you go, right? Um, but I think... I mean, and you know, we live, we're, this is, we're in a highly educated area where like the kind of the shop local movement is very strong. And I think people realize the value of that, you know, a bookstore in a town is a very important thing. And so I don't, I mean, Amazon is too big to, like we can't, like my, I always joke, I kind of hope that we're like the little critter on the forest floor and Amazon just never sees us, you know? Um, <laughs> that's how we can survive because we are small and we can, be nimble. The publishing industry and the, the kind of distribution has gotten a lot better. I think publishers realize as all those big chains were stores were closing that, oh yeah, we have all these independent bookstores that we should be serving better. Mm -hmm. So we get books faster, we get better discounts, those sorts of things are kind of coming around. And it feels like it's kind of turning a corner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Amazon is always going to take up such a big part of the market. But um, I, I do think there's some pushback happening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How about online? I worry more about Amazon's ubiquity in other areas than in books at this point, honestly. Yeah. I think, you know, we hear a, it's a self-selecting um, audience, obviously, but peop we hear in the store all the time people coming in and saying, oh, it just feels so good to be in a real bookstore, and I really want to hold this book in my hand, and I tried the Kindle, and it didn't work for me. And um, <laughs> so I think people have really come to identify what they value about bookstores um, and what they value about real books and will seek it out if that's something that they mm -hmm. want. Um, I'm not sure the same thing is happening for like where you go to buy your uh, paper towels and the more and more of that kind of stuff is being ordered in bulk mm -hmm. through Amazon. So in some ways, when I make my kind of anti-Amazon argument with people, I actually try to keep books out of it because I, I think that um, it's... 
it's taking over in a lot of other ways. And right. small independent bookstores mm. have found their niche and other local businesses that we count on um, might not have. And considering the implications of that, I think is really important. Yeah, I was thinking kind of in the analogy with music, you know, because uh, there's been this, you know, physical music, first vinyl records, and then mm -hmm. CD went down, and it's kind of come back up again, it seems, too. You know, mm -hmm. people yeah. don't want to just stream stuff for whatever reason. They want to actually have something. Yeah, vinyl sells yeah. better now than any yeah. other format of music, I think, you know. Um, right. Yeah. And because of that physical object, you know, it yeah. feels substantial and yeah. beautiful, and you can yeah. kind of hold it and cherish it. And I don't think people don't feel that way about CDs the same way because they or, weren't kind of constructed nothing. to be, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. I think the tangibility um, of it is something yeah. that's important. And yeah. the same thing with books, that that there is something you can hold to. As more and more of our lives becomes kind of etherized, you know, all of the stuff that just exists in the air, that if you can have this thing that you love and that you want to spend time with, um, that it matters, that it really does matter. What, what about the Kindle and the online book? That Did that, it seemed, I, I read it, it's been a while for yeah. me that that, plateaued too. And, yeah, e you know. e ebooks kind of like had this, you know, and all these publishers are super excited about it because it's, they're, I mean, in, in some ways it's, it's cheaper. I mean, it's cheaper to produce and they make more money and they can sell it for the same amount as a book. But I think it, it's plateaued and maybe even like the ebook sales have kind of plateaued or fallen slightly in the last few years. I think part of that is the technology just isn't there. And I, and I do think there is something about like who's reading, yeah. um, you know, and the fact that I, I, maybe the, I'm sure the numbers say otherwise, but even at Green Apple and in the store here at, in Point Reyes, like we noticed, you know, a, I don't know, maybe 40% to half of our customers are under 40. Mm -hmm. I think people who are, um, I think there's kind of this conception mm -hmm. that, misconception that people under 40 aren't reading, but a lot of people spend all day in front of a screen like many of us, and they don't want to pick up a, a you know, a mm -hmm. glowing screen to read. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's a self-selecting audience, but we see the great thing about being in Point Reyes is that you see people from all over the world, you know, mm -hmm. um, Bay Area and beyond, that um, it's like a very interesting sampling of people who are coming in. Mm -hmm. you know? I did see a report recently that actually some of, I don't know if it was the dreaded millennials or whatever, but that they're actually reading more than other cohorts now, which surprised me, yeah. really, because that the stereotype is that they don't. Yeah. Um, but that I've heard that they're actually buying or reading more books than some of the older Yeah, Yeah, cohorts. it's definitely our anecdotal experience. It is interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't expect that really, in a sense, but we all have stereotypes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so the store itself, um, since it's not going to be an all kids bookstore, um, you have a very. Broad... And we have a great kids section. I know. That will yeah. only get better. Yeah. I'm certain of that. <laughs> They'll all be a little chewed on. So yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> better and more beat up. <laughs> but um, do you have so as far as inventory and scope? I mean, you've got a full service, a lot of things in there. Is there? Uh, is there? You characterize it in a certain way that there's particular interest for you that you really specialize in or feel stronger in or more interested in. My hope is that we that our nature and environmental writings section is I want it to be like the best in the country. Um, mm -hmm. There's not a lot of bookstores that stock a good you know environmental or writing, both sort of critical, you know theoretical scholarly stuff, but then also natural histories and things. We've really uh, we've expanded those sections a lot and guidebooks. I really I mean that's just like a hobby of mine. So I love having mm -hmm. a well stocked guidebook section. Um, you know, literary fiction, poetry, and we, we care a lot about poetry. And um, probably only the first, the only one of the only sections we actually moved in the store, we moved poetry up to the front. And it was actually one day pretty early on, we moved it up, um, and there was a round table that was a display, and we moved that kind of toward the front. And I, w I watched a woman, you know, very people were coming in when we first took over to kind of suss it out and, you know, see what we were all about. And... She did a circle through the store, and she, she said, you got rid of the poetry section. I said, oh, no, we moved it to the front there. And I could just see, she was like, okay, you've passed the test. <laughs> <Good. laughs> um, um, but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, for me, those two sections in particular, um, you know, but we, we do, you know, my experience at Green Apple was as a generalist bookstore, a big generalist bookstore, um, as you want to represent... Especially, you know, and moving from there, I, that store was thousands of square feet. Now yeah. then there were two locations that I was doing for both. And I felt, I was a little worried when we went into a 
1,200 square foot store. Like, how do you, like, I just, I'm used to ordering so many books. And, and I realized that the, the store is kind of the ideal size to, you just get the best books mm-hmm. and you put them out and you hope people find them. Um, and there's something about that space that I think is very conducive to that. That's just like some magic that happens there. Um, and so, but across, you know, all section, mm-hmm. all, all categories and, um, Someone said to me once, um, after browsing the store for a little while, the way the books are arranged and the way the shelves are arranged, it's so easy to browse and it feels so intuitive. And um, it was funny because we had kind of just taken down a whole bunch of the section size to repair them. And they were telling me, oh, it's so easy to find all the different sections I'm looking for. And I thought, it's funny you should say that at a time when they're not labeled. <laughs> what a strain. But there is this kind of... Um, one of our um, employees, Lisa, who's been with the store for um, since long before we we were, um, does like to talk about putting books next to each other that sing to each other. Um, and I think the store is a nice size for that kind of singing to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, we try to also keep it well organized and navigable and in alphabetical order. But you know, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. Do you have any? I mean, so. Customers. I mean, it's you've got regulars, I'm sure, from local and mm-hmm. otherwise. And uh, I mean, have you met new people in that? I mean, it's a cult. You're, you're getting that same kind of cultural feeling. You were mentioning it at, oh, yeah, at Green yeah, Apple. Yeah. There, right? Even somehow, even it's even more. I mean, it's broader for sure. But you have the conversations we have there. I, I think a bookstore in the city that is a neighborhood bookstore. People are running errands and they have to come in and pick up this book or something. Um, and because of the locations of Green Apple, you get some tourists because. The store has been there for 50 years, and it's near Golden Gate Park. But the store on Clement was like a—it's like a department store. And my job was a lot behind the scenes, and you're always running around, and there's always plenty to do. Um, which isn't to say there's not here, but I think like standing behind the counter that you just have these incredible conversations on a daily basis about you know people who are coming from all over the world again, and um, I think surprised. I think people are surprised to find a good bookstore mm-hmm. in a small town. I think there's. Um, which is always kind of nice to sh- surprise people in a in a good way. Um, next, to, next to a nice bakery. Next to a nice bakery. Yeah, yeah. 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 What's not to like? Oh, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, and so yeah, those conversations happen a lot, and um, are you know, as Molly said, like they're that's kind of the re- one of the major rewards of the of the job. Yeah. So you get to talk to people, and then you have these kind of coincidental conversations and things that kind of spark ideas and. So tell us a little bit about how it works. You were talking about reps coming in. So when you're in terms of buying, mm-hmm. deciding what's there, I mean, do you have a steady flow, certainly of information, of emails and everything about catalogs from various publishers, and then you just pick and choose, you know? Mm-hmm. Is that? You know? Yeah. So I've been a buyer for, I guess, 10 years, starting with, starting at Green Apple. But we see um, Paul Yamazaki, who's the buyer at City Lights, who's been there for close to 50 years now, is a good friend. and. We kind of like one afternoon. We we spent some time looking. We decided that we probably see eighty five to ninety thousand titles a year, and that's like a tip of the iceberg of what's published every year. You know, there's self published books, and it's in the millions. But you know, what we see presented from publishers and catalogs, mm-hmm. either a paper catalog or increasingly on- online, um, you know, and you can kind of you you know immediately that you know ninety percent of some catalog isn't going to be for you. But then there are some gems in there that you your sales rep might tell you something about some publicity that's lined up or, you know, if it's some kind of cultural figure who you just don't know, um, they, they can direct you in that in that way or tell you information that you don't have. But a lot of it's just kind of intuitive or, you know, you get a sense of what your customers or your, you know, mm-hmm. and a lot of it's just like personal curiosity. Um, mm-hmm. I think, you know, we take risks on books that um, sometimes work, sometimes don't, but. Mm-hmm. Um, so how does it work in the business? So if you order a bunch of one, I mean, Stuff you don't sell, what happens with that? Do you eventually mark it down? Can you send stuff No, we're lucky, yeah, we're lucky to be able to send things back. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, there are, you know, we just seasonally, we kind of do returns um, seasonally. We don't do a ton there. I mean, in, in a bigger bookstore where, you, where you're buying more, you're inevitably going to return more. Um, mm-hmm. And there are all sorts of guidelines as to what percentage, ideally, that should be. Every store has a different philosophy. Um, at Green Apple, it was very much like, well, if you're not doing returns, you're not taking risks. And so you would be constantly doing returns, with, which I don't, you know, like personally, I'm not sure that's the case because we're kind of, we want to be mindful of our carbon footprint and the very, you know, you don't want to just constantly be sending things 
out into the world and UPS or FedEx coming to pick up. Um, so we're conservative, I think, in quantity of books, but not in the breadth. I think um, like we might do three of something as opposed to ten, and then you know see how those three, three go. And mm -hmm. um, and as I said earlier, like our distribution channels are getting better, so it's easier to get things back in more quickly. And books publishers are the ones that then that also approach you with, hey, we have an author who might want to come and read. Mm -hmm. and yeah, some of that, that happens. Do you set up some of your own? We set up some of our own. We have a really good community, and we know a lot of writers. Um, and and who doesn't want to come to Point Reyes for uh, you know a week? Yeah. Especially people who are doing their tours, who are at L.A., maybe Santa Cruz, San Francisco. Then they're gone on to Portland and Seattle. It's just like take a night and come to Point Reyes um, for the you know or for a weekend. And mm -hmm. we've had a couple of writers come for a night and then stay for a week. You know you can't get rid of them, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, which is really great. I mean that's great um, yeah. because there is kind of an uphill battle with publishers because they're thinking, they're thinking like what is this tiny store in a right. community of you know 800 people? Um, why do we send someone there? But then I think when, once they realize what is possible here, um, some of the events over the years, I mean that Kate and Steve started and then that we've kind of continued, you can get 300 people yeah. for the right, the right writer. Um, or you get 70 people in the store, you get 20 people in the store, and it ends up being a really special nice. night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So books itself, you, you've uh, brought some show and tell. We, some. Thing we like bring that. them everywhere. Of course. <laughs> no, I mean, we were looking, I mean, this car was like my old car. I mean, it's basically a mobile library of molding stuff, you know, yeah. especially when it's... We recently bought a 1992 so. Volvo station wagon, yeah. and I use it more often and it is starting to get filled with books that I, we walked out to get a couple of boxes and I was like, oh, I don't know if I've ever like opened the door with someone standing there next to me. <laughs> well, no, it's got deep mind. seat back yeah, it's got deep, yeah. one of the perks of those the old Volvo wagons. Yeah, the same, you know. <laughs> um, well, let's say for, you know, just in terms of what you, your business so far, have there been any particular titles that just continue good sellers for you, you know, that you... Yeah, actually, um, last winter, maybe many of you probably know this book, The California Field Atlas. This book, do you know this book? Um, so Obi Kaufman, his name is Obi Kaufman, um, did this book. It's watercolors and it's a field atlas, um, basically all of California. It's kind of an art book. Um, is that Heyday? Heyday did yeah, this, yeah. yeah. We and had so, Malcolm did a talk here once, Malcolm yeah. Golan, oh, yeah, founder sure. of Heyday. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, this book last year around this time, I think we were the last bookstore to have stock because this was a book that I was very aggressive on. I thought like if, if any store is going to sell this, it'll be us. And, um, and one of the models that I, Heyday did a consignment model so I could order a hundred copies from them and not pay until we sell them, mm -hmm. which was a very unique thing that, that Malcolm started. Um, but so we jumped on it and everyone sold out and they had to reprint, they had to reprint in China. So it had to come over on both. And there was a <laughs> strike at the docks and so they couldn't get the books and, but we've sold 500 copies of this book in a year um, uh -huh. which is an incredible thing yeah um, we should we could use this to mention also actually that one thing we added in the last year was that is that we have an online store you can store, search yeah. yes. um, yeah, our yeah. website and order books online both books we have in the store and anything that we can get from our distributor yeah. that we can send and the kind of wild thing that happened with this book at this time last year was that since we were one of the only bookstores around that still had it we were getting these orders from <laughs> New York and Hawaii and, yeah. and you know at, like all over um, yeah. and it was kind we, of fun to we couldn't figure out from, how everyone yeah. found us so yeah. we were very excited about it yeah. but we also shipped to Bolinas Sure. Yeah. I'll drive down. I'll, I'll yeah, make right. the drive. <laughs> Anytime. Put it in Volvo. Yeah, put it in the Volvo. Yeah. Add it to the pile. Um, <laughs> what else? Another um, nature one here. It looks yeah, like. some other books. One of our best sellers this year is a, a book that's 50 years old called The Peregrine by J.A. Baker, British writer. An amazing book. I mean, an obsessive book about a guy following hawks. And it's very much just that. It's almost. It's written as a diary. I think it actually took him... It covers 10 years, but he wrote it, and then you read it as if it's all in the same mm -hmm. six months or something. Um, there are some really well-written blurbs on the first page. <laughs> so I have a, I have a, oh. I'm kind of obsessed with this book, and I, we sell a lot of this book. It's a great cover. I mean, it's hard to, like, mm -hmm. resist that, um, the simplicity of it. But I have a friend who works New York Rio Books, does a lot of reprints of, of mm -hmm. classics. They bring a lot of things that are out of print back into, to, into print. Um, and I wrote about this, as, I'm, as I sort of tend to do, for a, um, 
a website that was just sort of like, what five books are you reading? And I did that. So a friend who, uh, I wouldn't have mentioned this, but I knew you were going to say something. Um, so the blur, she put, I have a, she put something that I wrote about it on the blurb page with like Werner Herzog and Helen McDonald and Robert McFarlane. And so I was like, oh, this is my peak. I have like, I'm done. I, not, I don't ever need to do any other book selling again. But the, it's an amazing book. And, uh, We've done like a book club for it. Um, it's just one of those kind of things you can kind of dip. It's very lyrical writing, um, and you know you can kind of dip in and out. And, and the fact that it is written as a diary, like sometimes I'll just open up and see if that day is in here and read a passage. Mm -hmm. And this was written kind of I think in '67, so it was like during the height of the kind of the DDT. It seemed like you know hawks were weren't going to be around for much longer. Um, thankfully, they are. But I think there was kind of there's this elegiac sense to it um, that and the, and the author at the time I think was undergoing some kind of um, an illness that's never referred to in the book it's it's referred to in the introduction but it's a kind of a sense of loss but also this sense of like what the natural world can provide us um, and how you know both how distinct it is from us but also how enmeshed we are in it mm -hmm. um, it's a beautiful book well I saw you know McFarlane so he, he's a famous writer about yeah walking around and traveling, yeah. he walked all around the United Kingdom, and he wrote a book. And then Herzog, there was a book. So I'm, I'm just reminded of a couple of years ago, I came, you guys were part of a book club, mm -hmm. as it were, that was meeting down on the bay, and it was it's the theme seemed to be walking or traveling like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was a book of Werner Herzog, filmmaker about walking. Of, half, of walking in ice. Halfway yeah. across mm -hmm. Europe and yeah. everything. And so here I was, a, you know, a 20-year book critic, for the Chronicle, and I sat down with these folks and their friends, and they got dug into this book, and I didn't even understand what you guys were talking about. <laughs> they, were like, <laughs> they were really into it. The yeah. detail was like, yeah. oh, that was a book about a walk, you know. But then it got really, <laughs> and it was really impressive. They were really serious about uh, what this book meant to them. Yeah. And all yeah. you people, it was really great. You know, is That's that still a, going yeah. on? Do you do that at all? No, we had right. well in various iterations, but yeah, not that yeah. whole group again. But mm -hmm. that yeah. book is it's still in print. Actually, you know, the filmmaker Werner Herzog, who's a yeah. very yeah, it's you know, he's a very particular individual, but he he had a friend, he was in somewhere in Germany, I forget yeah. where exactly, but he had a friend, a filmmaker, a critic who was in the hospital in Paris, and he, in the Herzogian way, thought that if he walked to her, she wouldn't die. Mm. And so he walks, he breaks into these cabins along the way in the mountains, and yeah, it's yeah. icy. And, winter. Yeah, it's winter. And then he says, like, well, I should make a detour and see where Joan of Arc is, is buried, you know, in, in February or something. Um, and he finally gets to Paris, and his friend survived. Yeah. Um, so you can't say it didn't. It wasn't because of his walk, you know. <laughs> it took him months. It took him months, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, right. But yeah, he's a big fan of the book. He did a thing down at Stanford with um, Robert Polk Harrison about, about the Paragon. It's one of his favorites. Mm -hmm. um, and well. Molly, you have a couple here. I'm going to give you... Are talking about yeah. recent favorites or well, long-time favorites? Or, well, we were talking about events, and this was yeah. one of our favorite events of the last year. Um, Michael and Dottier had already had a relationship with the bookstore and with Stephen Kate and had um, done readings and events there before, which um, we felt... Very. When we learned that, we were really excited because he's one of our favorite writers, and to kind of already have that foundation of a relationship was really exciting. Um, it's, and the first time he came into the story, we both kind of just a little got a little string. Like, you yeah. know who that is, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um. yeah and so he, um, this novel, Warlight, is the um, the latest from him, and. He came and did a, a reading and conversation at Toby's Feed Barn. Um, we had we had the place packed, everyone, you know, sitting on hay bales, as you do at Toby's. Um, and it was a really special night. And it's a beautiful novel, um, as his always are. I think I am really drawn to prose by poets, um, which all of his, his work is. Um, and it's a pretty spellbinding story. That um, it's it's kind of hard to describe without spoilers, and I don't want to kind of give those. Yes. But it's it's basically um, a it kind of starts with these um, these young children who are kind of going through a, a tumultuous time um, where their their parents have left on kind of a mysterious mission, 
and it goes through time and follows them into adulthood of piecing together just what that mission was all about and what it was. But it's a lot about um, memory and war and secrets and lies, and um, it's really beautiful writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are we going to talk about either that or the lost words? Yeah. We could pull this one out, actually. This is a really, the, the biggest oh, yeah. one here. Um, this is a really special book. Speaking of Robert McFarlane, um, The Lost Words. And kids' books. And kids' books, yeah. If I this mean, is even, I just I feel mean, like this is like story time now. You can, book. this is, um, some of you might remember like 10 years ago, the Oxford Junior Dictionary cut out, um, you know, a bunch of nature words in their children's dictionary. <laughs> Um, because they were no, they, they were doing relevant, an updated you know? edition. Like yeah. Acorn wasn't relevant, but broadband was or something. Um, <laughs> and so there was kind of this big outcry among writers, Terry Tempest Williams and Robert McFarland and a whole bunch of writers wrote this open letter kind of decrying that. And so now 10 years later, Robert McFarland and, and the illustrator Jackie Morris, as you can see, is just amazing. I mean, these, these are absolutely stunning images. Um, so they compiled a bunch of those words, and McFarlane wrote these little poems um, about a lot of these words that were cut out, um, and they put it in this deluxe, beautiful edition of a book, which I think is going gonna, is gonna to be one of these books that's here, then it just goes away, and then we don't see it again, um, because the printing is so ornate and beautiful. But mm -hmm. this is a, it's a special book. It's definitely a special book, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and it feels, I think it it feels particularly special in charge to us, actually, because of Terry Tempest Williams' yeah. connection to it. Um, when we were first, when it was first announced that we were going to be buying the store, um, Steve and Kate organized this beautiful, sort of culminating farewell event for them, essentially. Um, there was a reading with uh, Terry Tempest Williams, and also that was sort of our opportunity to stand up and wave and say, Hi, we're the new kids. Um, and that was just such a special evening. And one of the things that Terry talked about in her talk um, was she read a whole bunch of these words um, mm. and sort of invoked that. And yeah. a lot of that that evening felt like a charge for us. You know, this is like this is what we're stepping into. This is the importance of this work. This is the community that's going to be here to support us. It was a really special moment. Um, and so actually, it I think means a lot to us personally to now have this book to sell yeah. um, and say these words yeah. are important. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's, uh, it's obvious that if you don't have these words, you don't, and you know, if you're a child who grows up without the word acorn, you don't know that acorns are missing or, you know, you, or any of these things, like you need language. And that's what McFarland being somebody who's very much behind that. Um, kind of that charge, that mission, um, to make sure that we we know that, that we are losing things and that you have the language to articulate that um, is, is really important. Um, this one looks related. Oh, yeah, this mm -hmm. one. I brought this just because I love this book. Um, mm -hmm. It's called Wildland, and it's this husband and wife photographer team went to all seven continents and were basically looking for the like kind of the last wild places. And then we, I just pass it around because I don't know if you can even see it from there. But I mean, the photographs themselves are mm. stunning. Um, just beautiful. Um, there's this page, and I won't be able to find it now, of course, but mm. there's a page where there's hundreds of birds circling in the sky, and you think, like, oh, what kind of bird is that? Maybe like a crow or something, and they're all eagles. Mm. And they just, like, the work that they put into this and the time that they must have spent um, doing this. This is another book that we, we speaking of our sales reps, we went to, um, we have an annual trade show in in various places in the Bay Area, and it was in Oakland this year, and our one of our sales reps found me, and he came up to me, and he was like, this book, this is just like, take this, look at this, this is like going to be something that you love, and of course he knew, um, and that's, you know, these relationships you form with your people who are, you know, in this industry, I think a lot of them for the same reasons that we are, is to find your people, um, and he knew, I think he was very aware that this book would be something that we would both be in love with. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And they are related ideas, yeah. you know, this, yeah. the disappearance very heavy. of some of these things. Yeah, thanks for yeah, yeah. <laughs> taking those ones on. Um, do you sell any books that you can't stand? <laughs> no, this is being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> he 
I'm already, well, I'm already, I'm already out in trouble with Will Self. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, We're toast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's whatever people want, right? But, yeah. 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 So but people, you, people ask that sometimes, like, oh, what do you, what books do you judge if somebody's buying them? And it just doesn't feel yeah, 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 that way. Yeah. I don't know. I get, I get excited to be selling someone a book that I love. And then otherwise, I'm just happy to be selling them a book. You're just glad that people are reading. Don't have yeah. any. Yeah. Right. yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. That's not what it's for. Yeah. You brought a space is about. poetry book here, too. Poetry. Don't you? Poetry. Um, I think this would be the one that Molly has. Yeah, yeah. Well, I did bring, well, I bring, brought a poem. About this year, a I was a, a judge yeah. for the National Book Award. Uh, I was on mm-hmm. the poetry committee. I read a lot of poetry this year, like close to 300 books um, <laughs> of poems. Um, they're skinny, at least. They're skinny, yeah. yeah. That's what I said at the beginning, and then... But intense. 300 books later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, Steven said to me one night, I'm tired of reading about bones. <laughs> <laughs> you notice a lot of Poets themes and throughout yeah, yeah. contemporary well, I poetry. remember seven years ago, our, our dear friend, the late departed great Joanne Kiger, was a judge at a big poetry match, and in her house there was just stacks. I mean, a stack this big of yeah. books, this skinny is a lot of books. Yeah. And she was like... I'm never doing this again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I tried. I tried to put. My, they got to about my chest, in in our office yeah. above the store. Um, it was a great experience. It was an amazing thing to kind of see what is happening at this very moment in kind of po- poetry in the U.S. Some amazing books of poems. This is one of my favorites from the year, which was on the short list. It didn't win. Um, Eye Level by Jenny Shia, who is a Chinese American poet. Um, it's about her traveling, but I, the thing I loved about it the most, um, among all of the books of poems that are sort of personal, you know, I poems, and that she kind of steps back from herself in a, in a way, in a very kind of paradoxical way that I really found, unlike anything else I'd read. Um, there are some, uh, and you know, and that's not to say that a lot of those personal poems aren't great from other poets, but her, the kind of ways that she can disassociate and remove herself from her own experience and give a broader, almost like, it seems like a book of wisdom in a way, which, I, um, Mm-hmm. She's young, and you read this, and you think like, like you just have this, a sense of being in the world that is far m- much wiser than than your age. Um, mm-hmm. But that experience of, of being a judge was great. Now that it's over, and you know, we got to go to New York, go to the the gala, which was fun, and kind of be there for that. Um, wear a tuxedo. Wear a tuxedo. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. And you have one too from. Um, Another poet. Yeah, yeah. yeah, in that kind of category of, um, I mentioned that I tend towards prose by poets, and this is also in that category. And it's one of the books that um, both of us love this book, and it was probably one of the first things that we put on order when we first kind of took over the store and we're building our own little staff favorites. Um, and it's called Madness, Rack, and Honey by a poet named Mary Rufel. And it's a collection of lectures. She delivered these as lectures. Um, I would call them essays on the page. And it's just a really eclectic and beautiful collection of topics from really unique perspective. Um, some of the topics are on beginnings, poetry in the moon, um, on secrets, on fear, um, there's an essay that I love called Someone Reading a Book is a Sign of Order in the World. Um, let's see. Yeah, so and the last one is Lectures I Will Never Give, which is just kind of a list of other topics like that and a couple of <laughs> thoughts on them. Um, and it's it's a book that I constantly wish I was reading for the first time again because I remember reading it and just feeling so... Um, kind of charmed and fascinated by every page and every word. But you can also really dip in and out of it and kind of pick it up as, um, what do I need to read about today on fear sounds right. And uh, <laughs> it's it's a really unique perspective. Um, yeah. And it's published by Wave Books, which is a small publishing yeah, house that we love. Yeah. yeah, no, a great yeah. publisher. They, they actually published Joanne's last book. Yeah. yeah. Right there, too. Yeah. And, and, she, a, yeah. and uh, she has one of these minds, Mary Rufo has one of these minds that kind of moves in these strange associative leaps that you kind of think like, you know, I think very often we all read books and you kind of, you're like, okay, I can see how you did this or like you kind of knew that was coming with her. I feel like you never know Mm -hmm. what's coming next. And that Mm -hmm. to me is like one of the great pleasures of reading is to experience someone else's mind in that way Mm -hmm. um, beyond like writing a beautiful sentence or something. But um, Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, One other one that we have here is probably, this is my favorite novel of the year, The Overstory. Mm -hmm. 
Richard Powers is an amazing novelist, formerly very inventive. Um, this is about a group of people who come together over um, a threatened stand of trees. Um, I mean, the bookstore has a section of books about trees, so this, when this novel came out, we were like, oh, this is perfect for, <laughs> for us. Um, really great novel. Have you, you've, you've, I'm you, it right yeah, now. he's very good. Mm -hmm. um, he's always been very interesting formally, but I think this book, to me, feels like the most emotionally kind of honest and, and true uh, account of people and their relationship to each other and to nature. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just a lovely book. Um, yeah. Um, we, we got a few more. We're gonna, we got yeah. one more. Okay. Um, I grabbed this just because, well, I'm big, I'm because I like it, because, but because the cover is so good. It feels like a kind of arts and crafts kind of cover. This was written by a guy who was a archaeologist who worked for the BBC on a series, documentary series about life on a farm in the 17th century. Um, and then that series was successful and they moved to the next century. And, but they did everything as they would do it during that time. So, you know, he had to learn how to, you know, build a hedgerow and, you know, cut grass using um, the proper tools and things. So this is his book. It's as much a philosophical sort of attempt to understand what craft means and how it means for our bodies and our minds to be engaged as it is. Like there are some pointers on how to build a hedgerow. I don't know if, I don't need that personally, but <laughs> I, was, I was interested in learning that, you know, that, um, that it is like there's a sort of embodiment, as I said earlier, about like a book as a physical thing. I think mm -hmm. working with our bodies um, is is important, especially as we become more and more digital, um, and books that kind of lead you beyond just the book itself. Like I always think of the book as a kind of a conduit to other things. It's you know it is literally a door mm -hmm. that you open up and you can enter into, but then like you also have to exit the other side and mm -hmm. and go out into the world. And if you can be armed with you know a better sense or, you know, some refreshed sense of, um, of your place in the world and, um, and, and some idea of, uh, some new idea of how to be in, in, in a place that's important um, to me and I think through our kind of curation at the bookstore, something we care about a lot. So I imagine time is a great, I mean, for everybody, it's the, yeah. the biggest constraint in value. So, you know, to, to figure this out, what you're going to carry, but also just personally, you're still readers. So, you know, my problem for a long time, it took me into well into adulthood to realize that I could actually quit a book without finishing it partway through, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that I wasn't committed after the first 50 or 100 pages, I could go to something else because there's just so many that you might want to read. So, I mean, how do you, you guys are looking at reading for pleasure too, but mm -hmm. how do you pick, you know, I mean... <laughs> Yeah. Whatever the, I mean, I got, the, the so, latest book that came in, the one that's in my hand is... <laughs> yeah. Right, I do no. think we have to, and it's particularly... You know, Stephen being the buyer for the store yeah. is definitely kind of has that pressure to read for the store and right. to read. Yeah. And, you know, we know a lot more. of people. We know people. We have friends in publishing and we have editors who are friends and writers who are friends. So you have that obligation there, too, to right. um, kind of honestly engage with their work. Yeah, which often once you're, you know, it doesn't feel like an obligation once we're reading right. and yeah. loving the book. But yeah. sometimes we do have to remind each other. Like, let's just, it's okay to read something that is, you know, older or not going to be some, mm -hmm. you know, exciting new seller. And if it's something that's been sitting on our shelf for a little while, let's give ourselves a minute to read it. Yeah. yeah. You know. Well, I saw imagine, I mean, the last Sunday's was, you know, the New York Times book review was the best of the year. Yeah. You immediately get any of these if you don't have them already. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Because people, yeah. I mean, if something like this comes out, do people come in asking mm -hmm. for them? Yeah, yet? certainly. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. You also get pretty good at describing. I mean, we tr we aren't lying to anyone or trying to be disingenuous, but we I think we're pretty comfortable talking about books we haven't read because <laughs> um, you just kind of have to throughout yeah. the day in uh -huh. the store. So yeah. um, I'll never straight up lie and say to somebody, "I read that and I highly recommend mm -hmm. it," but yeah. you can kind of engage. Um, it's got a black and white cover. Things. You really yeah. like yeah. it. <laughs> It's yeah. about this thick. Um, yeah. and, um, it's a rectangle, and pa some people like you know this rectangle. Right um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and also all of our other bookselling friends. We have a lot of friends, both still at Green Apple and City Lights and various places in the East Bay. Um, we see each other a lot. We talk. We communicate. And if, if someone whose taste I trust says they loved this book, then I sort of rely on that as an extension of me as a bookseller right. saying to a customer that, 
you know, I can say, well, Brad at East Bay Booksellers, um, someone who also recently bought, it was Diesel Bookstore before on Rockridge. Um, he was an employee there and bought that from the um, original owners. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little after we took over. So he's someone too that I feel like um, <coughs> people whose taste you trust. Um, and, you know, there's a network right. of, of kind of, you know, we, we talk on Twitter or we email and, right. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So speaking of taste you trust, here's the hardest question I have for you. I'll let Molly answer this one. No, you both have. <laughs> it's, it's for both. So Thanks. desert island time. You're going off and they have, you have access, but you can only take books from three authors, mm. period. Don't think too hard, but, <laughs> but that's it for the rest of your life. You only read three books authors. from three authors. Mm -hmm. You can only read three authors okay. for the rest of your life. Who are they? Well, a couple of years ago, we organized a Moby Dick marathon reading oh, in San yeah. Francisco, um, which was a 28-hour yeah. uh, overnight affair. Um, so I would bring Moby Dick. That's, that's an easy one. But then we yeah. could bring all the other Melvilles. Yeah. Right? So okay. just, I, don't I don't know, know if I'd I want didn't... to read other Melville besides Moby Dick. But, um, okay, Moby Dick. I would bring... Yes, yeah, so the category is authors, so uh, we can have yeah, access to it. Okay. I, I wasn't yeah. going to make you just pick yeah. three books. Yeah. So Thank you. Three, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> any, any wiggle room we can get. Yeah. Try it. I'll take it. it. <laughs> Ooh. Um, this is when we just sit here for 20 minutes and Who silence. jumps? Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If it doesn't yeah. jump to mind, you can't do it because yeah. you'll get stuck. You know, yeah, I mean, I would... Like three... I think I could spend a desert island amount of time with Emily Dickinson. Mm -hmm. um, just mm -hmm. fascinated and not... Um, you know, you could never get to the bottom of it. Yeah. Kind of similar yeah. to Moby uh -huh. Dick, so... Yeah. She's on the list for me. That's one um, each. All right. I'll also say Joseph Conrad. I really love Joseph oh. Conrad. Um, you're really not giving yourself. You're is, you're on the desert island, and you're like gonna be, you know, also seafaring and yeah, struggling. I'm, and, I'm leaning uh, in. Yeah. I'm leaning in. That's up, up the river. <laughs> yeah. No escapism for yeah. the. Uh, yeah. And then like Shel Silverstein. I don't know. Maybe that would that be a good answer. For yeah, there you go. <laughs> Is a kid with us? That's the thing we need to know. I, I yeah. know. <laughs> he gets his own choice later. He, okay. okay. Right. Yes. I do have the Moby Dick. I read it finally because I was always at you know was a at little, that reading. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the kids one. It's just one yeah, word. One word. Page. It was really page. great. Yeah. Yeah. Whale. With, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Too hard, huh? That's a nice way to think about it. Actually, though, like what would be that kind of childlike uh, break from your Desert Island serious reading. I could go back into everything by Roald Dahl. I read all of those when I was a kid, so that could be a good thing to uh -huh. revisit on an island. Uh -huh. I think you got, each got one more. I each got one more. Oh boy. Well, it's fresh in mind because I didn't read it as a uh, kid. And I was like a huge like Arthurian nerd, but I recently read T. H. White's Once and Future King, the, the whole set, and I was amazed at how good they were and how rich the writing was, both about people and about the natural world. Um, I and I just feel like, in some ways, you, I feel I think some the books find you at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you just kind of stumble right, into right. them, and and you're fortunate in that way. I think maybe if I read them as a, as a kid, I would have a lot of it would have gone over my head. I'm sure I would have gotten something else out of it, but reading it as an adult. Um, as an adult, like soon to be parent, I felt like, oh, this is like the perfect time. I don't know, if, I don't know how I'd feel reading it again if I was stuck with it forever on a desert well, island. Was... But I'm just going to say that to put all the pressure yeah, no, on Molly good. to yeah. finish hers. <laughs> yeah. I'll give her a little more, another moment to think. So, I mean, if you ever, I'm wondering, that's the exact experience you were just mentioning that I've had a lot of reading a book when I'm teenager or 20, you know, when you really get into it, and then you come back to it and you read it again, and it's a real letdown. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> so it's just the right time and place. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. And it, yeah, and I do. I really, truly do believe that a lot of books just kind of find you at the right time, or you find them, and that's sort of one of the pleasures I think of browsing in a bookstore that you don't get if you're buying a book online is that sense of discovery. That something in that moment is, um, and I don't mean this in like a mystical kind of way, but there's something about that moment that the spine of this book or the cover of this book is just like uh, attracts your attention mm -hmm. in a way, um, and that happens often enough that I that I feel pretty mm -hmm. confident mm -hmm. in thinking that that that's is why it's an here. entire. A big important part of publishing is the the cover. Yeah. The people they have in the whole departments that just do the just covers. the covers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when they go paperback, they do a whole another. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Although I I believe because most books for their 
most of a book's life is going to be like this on a shelf. So I feel like spines are more important than covers. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. What'd you come up with? Well, I'm just going to I'm going to not overthink it and just name yeah. another favorite writer who I haven't mentioned yet, um, which is Angela Carter. Mm. Um, she was a, a British um, British writer in let's see when did she pass away? It would have been like, like early nineties early 90s, 90s yeah. or something. So mm. she was sort of she died relatively young last century. Um, her she's probably best known for her collection of short stories, The Bloody Chamber, which are sort of re dark, interesting. Um, reimaginings of fairy tales that make yeah. kind of twist things with with a feminist definitely feminist, yeah, definitely very strong feminist, feminist, feminist yeah. lens yeah. and um, twist things with gender and things like that. Mm. Um, so a lot of people know her for that, but then she also uh, all of her novels are um, magical and incredibly well written and kind of go in really different directions. One is very Shakespearean um, in its themes. One is um, about a circus and I mean, just any any world that she dreamt up is one that I would want to stay in for a while. Yeah. yeah, she was yeah, and she was very funny and kind of scabrous and um, yeah, yeah it's a I real think, yeah. a real character. Yeah, very much so. Um, of like of the generation of Salman Rushdie, um, but she died of cancer very young, like in her early fifties, I think. So it was a big loss when she. I think she's she's sort of a writer's writer. She's often yeah. like referenced by other writers or kind of a favorite of kind of that community. Yeah. Did you guys name any living writers? I don't think so. Nope. No. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. True. The dead ones aren't going to watch this. Back. No. Right. Yeah, Will Self. Yeah. Um, Will Self. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to damage control. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I will say one other because we read yeah, so much we read contemporary so much, yeah. stuff, but we all um, for Desert Island we went back to the right. It can be hard. I mean, that's one of the things about book selling too, and and this constant sense of trying to keep up with what's new is that you lose sight of everything that's come before that in some ways, and so you're constantly and it's hard to get a handle like a, a book that you love that was published in 2018 is that book going to last? And it's you know mm-hmm. sometimes it can be a fluke, or sometimes it's because a book. You know, it might it might not even book that anyone pays attention to in twenty eighteen, but then thirty years later it's mm-hmm. it's realized that it was ahead of its time or that it really spoke of our time. Um so that's like the other interesting part of curating a bookstore is trying to constantly negotiate between things that are kind of established classics, um, things that we love that aren't classics by any means, but but that kind of have some place. And then all these these new books that you you know that, that have this immediate a book comes out and three months later it's like people forget about it mm-hmm. in a lot of cases and uh, that can be more of the dispiriting part but the fun part of being a bookseller is that we are very actively involved in keeping those books front and center um, mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. So sorry, living writers. Yes, sir. <laughs> we love you I too. won't tell Daniel Steele you said. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a few minutes left if people want to ask questions and talk some more about anything related to anything we've talked about here today. Anybody? Read any good books lately? Hmm? Yeah. I'm just curious about your friends who are opening the bookstore in Providence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Providence has Brown and Risby, Mm -hmm. and it's University Town. Are they doing okay? You think they'll do okay? They are doing okay, yeah. So they opened a, a bookstore slash bar. So they have, oh, you know. Yeah. 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 Maybe it, the room where they yeah. picked another yeah. item with yeah. a higher markup yeah. than a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and if they're not doing so. okay, they can wash away their sorrows. But uh, um, one of the two, it's a couple um, who got married last summer, actually, and we know them. Um, one of the two worked for New Directions Publishing um, for years, and he worked at McNally Jackson, which is an amazing bookstore in Manhattan. Um, so he knows what he's doing. And, and his, his partner, Emma, went to Brown, so she knows that community. And she's a translator. Um, I think they're going to be fine. It's just kind of, you know, they have to kind of settle, and you have to, like, give it time. And um, you hope um, that, like, you kind of have to bide your time with rent and you, you know, make sure things kind of progress in the way that you want, um, mm-hmm. which we didn't really have to deal with so much because the store was there and, you know, people knew it already. Um, yeah, one of the things I was going to mention, actually, I, I know I have a couple of friends, you know, who've gotten into, besides you guys, have gone into the business too. And the one complaint they've had is they've felt really compelled. They've had to 
branch into a lot of non-book items too. The yeah. swag, all the stuff yeah. related, and, and music maybe too, uh, you know, whatever it is, clothing, yeah. you know, related to books too. Mm-hmm. And while, you know, in order to keep the place afloat, that people buy that more. But yeah. you guys don't seem to have that much of that. You got nice t-shirts. We got nice t-shirts, yeah. yeah. We don't do much of that. We're, yeah. yeah. We're very picky about those kinds of, um, they're called sidelines. Side, the, yeah. Those little um, gifty things that, you know, and we do, we, we have them, um, but we try That's, to keep them fitting within kind of the aesthetic and sensibility of the other, other things yeah. we have. Um, yeah. We're so dedicated to books in a small store that it feels like to lose a case that could be books to socks or something that a lot of bookstores yeah. sell. It just doesn't. And you can get that elsewhere in Point Reyes, of course, you know. And we're like one of the, you know, in a, in a kind of a resort town where, you know, prices can be marked up. Board, like, books, by contrast, you know, even even if they are prices, we can't mark books up. You know, books come with a price printed on them for the most part. So um, in certain situations, that can be a plus, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, somebody gave me a Hemingway corkscrew that I kind of liked, but that yeah. was, you know. So. Yeah, some of that stuff is cool. Yeah. You mentioned that on one side there's this great bakery, on the other side there's another store. So what would happen, and we talked about size, what would happen if suddenly the store on the other side became available to rent? Yeah. Um, what would be going through your mind? God, I hope it's not another bookstore. <laughs> 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 Um, yeah. yeah. Well, we were, we actually recently did an interview for a website called uh, the Literary Hub, where one of their questions they do a series called Interview with a Bookstore, um, and as you can tell, we like to talk about books, so it's pretty long. Um, and it went up a couple of weeks ago. And one of their questions was like, "What would you do with infinite space?" You know, and a lot of people say, a lot of bookstore people will say like a bar or a restaurant or something. Um, my answer, and I it, I think it's an honest answer, is that I really like. First of all, we're in a building that's 120 years old, and it's on the fault. So, like, I don't want to mess with anything. We don't want to mess with it. We don't want to go knocking down walls. Whatever dust is holding that place together, I (laughs) don't want to touch it. Um, But, I mean, I don't know. It would be tempting, for sure, um, to have an additional space. And I think one of the things that... I think the the book selection is fine as is, because I'm doing most of that buying myself, you know... um, that part is on me, and it, it, to increase, to double that would be double the work. Um, I think one of the great things would be, I mean, we have various places in town, and we've done an event here, and to do events and where people can gather, because it's a small space. Like, I think a, a place that could be more of a gathering spot for events and things, or just kind of a place to hang out would feel really nice. Um, but I'm sure eventually, if, if that did happen, and we you know, and we moved in or expanded, more and more books would start to fill the space, <laughs> like our home, you know. Um, yeah. 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 But that would make sense. Yeah. I don't know. Cabaline's great neighbors, though. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, we're happy. Yeah, it's it's nice to feel kind of contented with the space that we have. Um, yeah. And early on, we made a, we joked at the very beginning about, uh, like, cutting a hole in the wall between us and the bakery so that we could just reach through and get our morning buns. Um, And then someone came in to the store pretty early and said, I heard a rumor that you're going to have a little window. And I was like, okay, no more joking about that kind of thing. It's going to get back to the landlord. We're going to have to. Like, what are you doing? Smelling booze out the back. Yeah. 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 (laughs) So let it be known, no plans to expand anytime soon. Uh, Do you have recommendations for those of us with nieces and grandchildren around ages 11 and 12? And if we (laughs) hypothetically speaking, right? (laughs) (laughs) We wanted to ship off that book. Do you do that, or do you send us to the post office? No, we do. We We mail books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And on the website, we have lists of recommendations, but also in the store. Um, that was another section that we we moved it to the back of the store and the, kind of the back wall, and that was just this. There are so many amazing children's books right now. The art is incredible, as you can see from this one, The um, Lost Words. Um, it was, it's kind of like a renaissance for children's book publishing. Um, mm-hmm. So that part is fun. And, you know, um, yeah. and you know, middle grade, like 11 and 12, kind of middle grade young adult reading. That's an interesting age, too, yes. mm-hmm. cause they're, because they're kind of transitioning. Um, mm-hmm to reading, you know, more kind of adult material, but it's in that nebulous place. Um, yeah. So yeah, in the store we have some of our recommendations yeah. for that. But a lot of them are things that we and the other people who work in the store read when we were young, but we also have, you know, some of the, there's some really great um, 
just like I, I think it seems like there's a lot of awareness of centering, you know, strong female characters in books for that age group and kind of stories that break out of some of the usual tropes um, that are around. So there's a lot of those that we have on display and stuff too. Yeah. Question? Um, when Kate and I decided to uh, sell the store and initiated this process, which Molly and Steve referred to, um, when we received their letter, um, we immediately knew that they were the stewards. And um, they uh, had this passion and this spirit. And unlike Kate and I, knew had a deep knowledge of books. Um, and um, they've become beloved friends um, over the last two years. And um, I'm so deeply grateful um, for their presence and their incredible gifts that they brought to this community. And I also rec I want to recognize the fact that they didn't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be emphasized <laughs> enough. <laughs> I just want to, there's a few people in this room mm -hmm. that stepped up yeah. and um, helped them mm -hmm. make this um, dream a reality. And I just want to acknowledge them uh, in, the, in the room. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So there's a testimony from Steve number one. So yeah. I think that's the perfect conclusion here. So thank you all yeah. very much. And thank, thank you very you much. Both yeah, for thank being you all for coming. Yeah. Um, I should say, are these books all for sale?